The sports keeps going on the way it is. I don't think it's as bad as it was, Michael. During, that it, you know, I think it was really yeah. at the apex of corruption, and really, I, it was just awful when we were doing the investigation. I think we've cleaned it up a little bit since then. Uh, there still needs to be some work done. Uh, there's, there's no question. I mean, you were right on target. It's, it's a corrupt. The, the entire uh, sport was corrupt at that time. And, you know, so many of the fighters that I spoke to, trainers and so on and so forth, we all knew it. But, you know. I walk in redemption. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody's doing well. All is very good. Very blessed on this end. As always, I give God all the praise, honor, Glory and thanksgiving for that, especially through this holiday season, birth of our Lord. We celebrate it on December 25th. Hope everybody is in a festive mood, making the best out of this holiday season as we possibly can. Before I get into anything, just want to thank all of my supporters for the overwhelming support I've got with a couple of videos uh, that I've done in the last week or so. Uh, just know I appreciate it very much, and uh, my heart goes out to all of you. Uh, just very encouraging, and um, I thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart. Coming up soon, don't forget, December 30th in Woonsocket, just outside of Providence, Rhode Island. I will be appearing that evening. Uh, tickets gone very, very fast, and we're going to have a great night. We're going to get rid of 2023, bring in 2024, have a glass of champagne. It's going to be a great night. VIP meet and greet, signing, photographs, the whole bit. That's December 30th, and of course, on January 25th, starting the new year off right, myself, Mike Tyson, Chaz Palminteri, three guys from New York, going to be speaking about the neighborhood. Remade Men is the title of the event. You're not going to want to miss that. It's going to be very, very special. Get your tickets. They are going fast. Mike Tyson, the champ. You know, he's the headliner, of course, but we're going to have a great night. Yes, a VIP meet and greet, the whole bit. So come get your tickets now because they are going very, very fast. Today, I have a very special guest. And, you know, some of you have heard about this uh, investigation. It was called the Crown Royal Investigation. Actually, um, Sports Illustrated magazine did a huge story on this back in the 80s. It was entitled Shadow Boxing. I think we're going to put a graphic up uh, about that story. And um, the FBI agent in charge of that investigation was a fellow by the name of Joe Spinelli. He was the FBI agent in charge at that time. Joe really had a heart for professional boxers and for the boxing industry, the heavyweight fights, uh, all the fighting industry, as a matter of fact. And uh, his dad was a fighter at one time, and he just took an interest in it uh, early on. And he knew that the industry was corrupt. No question about it. I can tell you, you know, from my own perspective, as a member back then of organized crime, the Colombo family, that it was a corrupt, corrupt organization uh, from top to bottom. Joe Spinelli was in the heart of it. He started this investigation called Crown Royal. I became one of the major targets of that investigation, along with Don King and a lot of my mob associates. And uh, it was about an eight or nine month investigation that finally blew up. I'm not going to get into it. Joe is going to tell you about it. Uh, but, you know, there's been some speculation about, it. you know, the guys on YouTube, same thing, that I was actually working with the FBI. No, that's not the truth. I was a subject for that investigation, a target of that investigation. I think they had something like 83 tape recordings on me. And uh, I did bring one of the undercover agents in to see uh, Don King. We set up that meeting. I was the one responsible for that. Of course, I didn't know he was an agent, and it didn't amount to anything. Nobody got arrested. Nobody got indicted because I, I um, made Don King aware that even though I was with these guys for eight months, I wasn't really too sure of their backgrounds. So we were very, very careful. And as a result of the investigation, nobody got in trouble. But I want Joe to tell you the story because it's a very interesting one. And uh, he's a really good guy. He really is. He had his heart in cleaning up uh, the boxing industry, and he has done a lot of good. I'm not going to tell you about it. He is. So with no further hesitation, my special guest today, Joseph Spinelli. So, Joe, I just made a, uh, a good introduction and uh, talked about our relationship and how at one time we were on opposite sides of the law, I would say. You on the right side, me on the wrong side. And uh, I was once a target of, uh, of an investigation that you headed up that I will say this, uh, had it not been for a circumstance that happened, and we'll talk about that, you'll get into it, uh, you were certainly on the right track, and I think that uh, that investigation would have revealed a lot, but 
you know, things happened fortunately for me at that time and unfortunately for the investigation and the rest of the world. But uh, it's very fascinating and it's, it's wonderful to be friends and to be on the same side of the fence now. And, uh, and let's talk, let people know about this uh, fascinating investigation that you headed up. You know, we had a tremendous run with Crown Royal. It was an undercover operation uh, that you got caught up in to an extent. <laughs> and, and, and you know, our, our goal there, everyone used to come to me and say, oh, you guys are after Don King, Don King, Don King, which is a bunch of baloney. Uh, we, were, we were really trying to show, number one, the corruption in boxing that existed. And it all had its inception at the U.S. boxing tournament, ABC. I mean, it was kickbacks galore. Everything that you could imagine that should be happening in boxing happened during that tournament. And King was involved in it. So sure, obviously, he was someone that we were looking at, but not the only promoter we were looking at. Our focus was organized crimes involvement in professional boxing. And what, what was it that they would might have been doing at that particular time to corrupt the sport even more? Um, so, you know, we said, look, you know, I, I was on the heels of Abscam. I had done the Abscam investigation. Um, basically, I, I was case agent for a congressman who was indicted and convicted. It was the first time, Michael, we ever really did CCTV recordings of people taking bribes hand to hand. And that's, you, you know, you say, well, tapes are great evidence in court. And they are, you know, because you hear people actually their voices talking. But when you see people, in addition to hearing them speak, you know, that's that's a double banger for us. OK, so it really it really fortified our cases. Uh, and I said to him, this might be the best way for us to you know, show exactly what's going on in boxing, you know, who's involved, you know, who's really doing what, not just organized crime, but the state commissions, uh, you know, where who are up to their eyes in corruption, um, you know, basically taking bribes for licenses and things of that nature. Uh, so a couple of them went to jail for it eventually. Uh, and, you know, basically we were getting ready to do a, a boxing promotion. We mm -hmm. set up an undercover operation a company called TKO Promotions, right yep. across the street from Madison Square Garden. Uh, we had a couple of great undercovers, you know, basically just one posing as a, as a former drug dealer who was looking to launder money in the boxing game. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew what his game was, what he was involved in and what he was trying to accomplish. No one seemed to back down or back away because he was a former drug dealer or where that money may have come from, illicit funds and things of that nature. And we had other undercovers, you know, that were involved also. And basically what happened was we had gotten to a point where we were getting ready, as you well know, uh, to basically do a co-promotion uh, with Don King. And you were one of the individuals who was helpful in us getting that meeting uh, after you went through your protocol. And we were right there where we wanted to be to show, okay, we have a promoter who we have is suspect. We have we have organized crimes involvement. Um, we and not just you, Michael. We had a lot of other people, members of the other families, that all professed to have you know promoters under under their wing and basically could do anything that we wanted for the money as long as we had the money. Um, so the bottom line was timing is everything. Duku Kim fights Ray Boom Boom Mancini, mm -hmm. and unfortunately. One of the real unfortunate things in boxing, Ray Mancini basically kills him in the yeah. ring, and the boy and the young fighter dies, and I get a call immediately from Washington D.C., and the, the powers to be down there said we, we're summoning you. We want you to come down to Washington. We'll talk to you about Crown Royal. I knew it wasn't good <laughs> when I got that call. I went down there, and and the next thing I know is uh, they said, look, we can't we can't take the chance of something like that being replicated. And it's a and it's an FBI boxy promotion. God forbid someone gets killed. Can you imagine what we? They, yeah. the, it would not be pretty. So so the bottom line is, you know, they they terminated the operation right then and there. Unfortunately for us, um, but it didn't end particip my participation anyway because I still landed up in the United States Subcommittee on Permanent Investigations, testifying and advocating for a National Boxing Commission, which I also was was really intent on doing from the inception of the operation because I thought uh, um, predictable 
that there would be corruption if you go from one state to the other and certain rules are circumvented instead of having one cohesive unit and, and body, you know, basically overseeing a sport the same way they do in every other sport, right. baseball, hockey, football, they all have a commissioner. No commissions. We have sanctioning bodies in in boxing. Well, what do they do, Michael? You yeah. got you got the WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO. You know, there are probably even more now since you and I were involved in this operation. And all they do is take a fee. They take a fee, and they and they seem to have a good way of taking money to to rank fighters that just so happen to be associated with with the promoters that are giving them that money. Okay, exactly. Exactly. so. So, 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 so the bottom line is they have no real use. They, they, you know, basically the fighters are losing part of their purse to a sanctioning body that is not doing anything in their best interest. Let's be candid. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I worked a little bit with John McCain and, and sat down with his people while he was alive. Just a great man. I got to tell you something. Besides being a great senator, a tremendous advocate of boxing, actually fought in the Navy when he was in the service. And really loves boxing. He really did. He would have been um, a good president. You know, I think he would have. I, I think I think he I really think he would have. Uh and I grew I grew to really like him a lot. I really did. Uh, I worked a little bit with his people on the Muhammad Ali Safety Act, set trying to set up a pension plan, health care plan for fighters, you know, something that they could fall back on when they were done fighting. Too many fighters that I know personally, they had no health care plan when they finished. They had a lot of medical problems. What they died in the street. They couldn't they had no insurance. They couldn't they couldn't even get the proper medical treatment they that they not only deserved, they needed. They, they were in dire need of, you know? So I mean, working with him was was a lot really a pleasure. Uh landed up testifying. And I as you I'm sure I remember you did too in the United States Senate. Um you were on a different topic than myself. Uh but but I, I was really advocating very strongly for a National Boxing Commission, and I still am. Uh, if we could get the right person at the top uh, and basically get every get the support we need in, in the Senate, at, and the Senate is where we would have to get the votes uh, to do this. But the bottom line is, you know, the sports keeps going on the way it is. Um, I don't think it's as bad as it was, Michael, during, that, it, you know, I think it was really yeah. at the apex of corruption and and. Really, I, it was just awful when we were doing the investigation. Uh, I think we've cleaned it up a little bit since then. Uh, there still needs to be some work done. Uh, there's, there's no question. I mean, you were right on target. It's, it's a corrupt. The, the entire uh, sport was corrupt at that time. And, you know, so many of the fighters that I spoke to, trainers and so on and so forth, we all knew it. But, you know, what was interesting to me, Joe, it was, it was a very effective uh, operation because, when Victor Quintana came to me, who was the agent that posed as the drug dealer, uh, he was good. I had no idea who he was. He romanced me for, I would say, eight or nine months. I understand he had 83 tape recordings on me, something like that. I, I remember we used to play racquetball. I got to like him, and I think he got to like me during a time. Um, and he used to, we used to play racquetball, and at that time he had the Nagra tape, and I didn't know that, but... Uh, he always used to complain of back trouble, but that's where the Nagra was in his back, you know. Uh, but he did his job. Yeah, he did his job really well. And uh, he had me fooled. And, um, you know, I, as you know, I walked him into the uh, Don King's office at that time. Of course, I didn't know he was an undercover agent. And Reggie Barrett, I think he was the uh, he was the. Um, the guy that worked, yeah, he worked with Muhammad Ali at one time, right? I think he did. He knew. He actually knew Ali when Ali was having trouble getting his license because he didn't go into service. He was very helpful in Atlanta and helping him get that fight with Jerry Quarry uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and they knew each other for quite a while even before that, and they had a good relationship. They really did. Actually, he brought me up to Deer Lake to meet Ali. Um, Ali was training for his last fight with Trevor Burbick, mm -hmm. and. Uh, <laughs> As I, as I often say, you know, I went up there and I knock on the cabin that Ali's in and he opens the door and there he is, bigger than life, right? <laughs> and I said, I said, I liken it, I liken this to a kid who finally got the Christmas present he was always asking for his entire life, you know, meeting Muhammad Ali. Ali it was yeah. just, it was, it was incredible. And we, you know, we hit it off incredibly well. You know, we, he knew I wasn't just there for 
stupid investigation. He knew I knew boxing. We would talk. I went through his entire career, Michael. Every fight he had, what round he beat the guy in. I came up with Rudy Lubers. He didn't remember fighting Rudy Lubers, okay? that That's the funny part of the story. But he asked me, do you want to run with me uh, tomorrow morning? Now, this is a guy who's 37 years old. He's at the end of his career, you know. He's not really, you know, a young man anymore. He's just training for his last fight. I said, champ, I'd love to run with you. Sure. He said, 530 tomorrow morning. Don't be late. I said, mm -hmm. okay, champ, I'll be out there. I couldn't sleep, Michael, the entire night. <laughs> I, I, I was like so excited. I said, I don't want to be late. You know, you get mad at me or something. Well, I come out and there he is, you know, sweatsuit, always ran in combat boots. Yes. Okay. And he goes all the way over to the right of me. Way, quite a ways over and he's scratching he goes all right you ready i says yeah i'm ready champ let's go and we take off and i'm about a mile into it right and i'm saying to myself what could be better than this mm -hmm. i'm here step to step running an entire mile already with the greatest fighter that ever lived then i had my bubble burst i looked to the right the son of a gun was running backwards the whole time <laughs> <laughs> wow i said champ i said were you running backwards the whole time he goes you don't think you keep up me if I was running frontwards, do you? <laughs> <laughs> just, just like that. No, and I got to tell you, you know, you have you have certain moments in life where you meet certain people that you never forget. You know, um, I, I I've had several, and he, meeting him was really a highlight. I've highlighted my life. Well, I, I can tell you, I had a similar experience. I had a rap party for a movie that I produced back in uh, the early '80s, mid '80s, '84. And uh, we had a big party and Angelo Dundee and him were in town. So I called him up and I says, well, hey, will you come to the party? And he came. And that was like a highlight for me because we got to talk and he was, I, I loved him. I mean, I had to love him in the ring. He was such a showman and such a brilliant fighter, you know, such a warrior. And uh, yeah, I asked him about a lot of his fights and he was so entertaining and very, very courteous, very cordial, very oh, yeah. respectful. He he was just a good guy. He really was. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. I got Bell's palsy during the course of this operation mm. with, with Crown Royal, and Bell's palsy is a humbling experience because it it basically paralyzes the entire left side of your face. So you dribble, you don't know you dribble, and at night you have to sleep with a pat with a patch on your eye because the cornea will dry up. Really, it's it's really a, it's really a serious, and you, it's it's treated with prednisone. You take ten. 10 pills of prednisone and then in regressive doses you take nine the next day eight and so forth while i'm home on my back my mom and dad are with me uh just coincidentally on a friday night the phone rings and my father picks up the phone and he comes running in he goes joe he goes muhammad ali's on the phone for you i said mm -hmm. someone's kidding around you know i get on and as soon as i get on i knew it was him you know he goes are you all right <laughs> i said i said Chair, yeah. He goes, it didn't get to your brain, did it? <laughs> I said, I said, not yet, Chair, not yet. He goes, you gotta, you gotta get better. You, you know, you know, when you left, when you left, I was telling people, this guy may do something to the fighters. He cares about the fighters. That's all he really cares about. And you know, that was my concern. My dad was a fighter in the Marine Corps, great fighter. He had 16 pro fights. You know, that's when he used to fight. Up at St. Nick's Arena, that was a big thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Sunnyside Gardens. Sunnyside, you know, he, yeah. He, Went he, there many he, times he, with my dad. Yeah. Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah, I bet. Well, my dad uh, was an he, amateur yeah, fighter. Your dad too. was. A, I was going to say your dad yeah. was a pretty good fighter himself. Yes. Um, and I'm not talking about outside the outside the ring. I'm talking about in the ring. <laughs> in the ring. He wasn't bad outside the ring either. Trust me. He should. He should have. He should have stayed as a fighter, Joe. He might have done a little bit better. Well, yeah. Well. well it, you may have had a different habitat for, for yeah. let's put it that way, you know, but yeah. life is life. Uh, but yeah, he, you know, and it just meant so much to me that he took the time. And I was, I was supposed to be out for months, two weeks, I was back to work. And then right back into the operation, you know, going to different commissions, you know, basically being told by certain members of the commission, commissioners, you know, if you want to get a license, you got to, you got to grease this guy, you got to pay that guy. You know, and we were recording all those conversations. So, you know, we we got a pretty good indication of what type of corruption did exist, where it existed, and at what level. I, I'll never forget. It took a long time before I would bring um, uh, Quintana and Barrett in to see King. And you were, as you know, I, I put Sharpton in the middle of that to make the uh, the um, introduction. 
Um, but I'll never forget when, when I brought him into the office and I think everybody got excited. I think, hey, this is it. We're going to get with King. And, and I went into the office first and I said, Don, I know these guys for you know, several months now. I got friendly with them, but I can't trace them any further back. Please say everything above board in this meeting. Don't say anything out of the way. And I think he followed the script that day. Um, yeah, but, but see, what you may not know after that, uh, he said, you comfortable with these guys? I said, I'm getting more comfortable. I think the next meeting might have been everything you wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I really do. You know, what you, what you don't know is that when he got, he was um, in a big war with a promoter down in the Bahamas named, named James Cornelius. Mm -hmm. And Cornelius was, was the one who promoted the Ali, Bur uh, Ali Burbick fight. And King wanted a piece of that because he had the contract with Burbick. So mm -hmm. he files an injunction to make to basically say you can't his fight cannot go on. And they they summon him down to the Bahamas. He goes to see Cornelius. And to make a long story short, he gets beat up like you wouldn't believe. I mean, physically really? beat up. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't funny because uh, I saw him when he came back. He comes back and calls the FBI office, and he said, I want to see Joe Spinelli. I'm going to file a complaint against Cornelius. Let's see if Spinelli is real. You know, I, I want to see if he picks and chooses who he's, who's basically he's doing business with around here, and he's going on and on and on. So my my, my supervisor says, you got to go over and see him and talk to him. You know, let's get a get his complaint, get the information, and we'll do what's right. You know, no, you know, I want he's a citizen. He's, he deserves the same thing everyone else does. And that's fine with me. So I go up to his office at 69th Street, and I'll never forget it. You got to take an elevator to the second floor to get to his office, okay? Mm -hmm. And and I go up there, and first time I ever saw him in person. I, first of all, I, I didn't realize how big a guy he was. He's, yeah, he's, a, he's, a, guy. He, he's a big fella. Yes. Um, and he gets up, and he he starts in on his, in his act, you know? Spinelli. He goes, I wake up in the morning. He says, and I look up in the ceiling and I know it's Spinelli listening. And I walk down the street and I look over my shoulder and I know somebody's following me and it's Spinelli. He goes, that's all I hear is Spinelli, Spinelli, Spinelli. And he starts, he just goes on and on. And then he, it's kind of funny. He comes around the desk and I didn't know what the hell he was getting ready to do, but I was getting ready to protect myself. <laughs> he comes around the desk and he puts his arm around and he goes, you know, Joe, he goes, I'm not the worst guy in boxing. He goes, I play by the rules just like everyone else. You know what the problem is with you and me, Joe? You don't like the rules. Mm. You don't like them. He said, but I play by them. And I said to him, I said, you know, Don, I'm going to take that to heart. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, when I go when I go to the Senate and I talk about a National Boxing Commission, I'm going to make sure there's one set of rules. So nobody can circumvent them. And the sport's going to be better for it. It's going to be 100% better for it. It really is. And he says, you're my little Italian brother. You know, <laughs> so he starts right in on me, you know. Um, and I walked yeah. out. He was big. And, and I saw him. I saw him again in Grand Central not that long after that. And he saw me and he, come, he came walking over to me and he goes, you still investigating me? I says, no, I'm not, I'm not even in the FBI anymore, Don. He goes, oh, what are you doing? I says, I'm the Inspector General of New York State. Now he goes, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote this scathing report about the New York State uh, Athletic Commission when Witherspoon fought James Bone Crusher Smith for the championship, the WBA championship. Carl King was the manager of both fighters. Mm -hmm. He wasn't licensed. Neither fighter was licensed in the state of New York. And Don King, who was the promoter, was not licensed in the state of New York. Absolutely not. So, right. so I wrote this scathing report, right? And he goes, that's even worse. Now you, you're attacking me on the state level instead of the federal level, <laughs> you know? And and it was just coincidental. I mean, you know, yeah. it was, I was I was given the investigation because of my knowledge in boxing, and and I went with it. And we changed everything. And that New York State Athletic Commission is run 100% better now, no question about it. Well, Without it, question. You know, I got to tell you, Joe, a couple of things that I was impacted from that investigation. After it all, there's a couple of things. And one of them was, I, I think you know this, I'm not sure, but my brother obviously had a drug problem back then. 
And um, Victor Quintana, the undercover agent, Victor Guerrero, I think was his real name, Victor, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, he came to me at one point and he alerted me about my brother's problem. I think my brother was trying to buy, buy drugs from him. Now, obviously, I didn't know that uh, Victor was an agent at that point, but that struck me later on. I said, man, he could have put my brother in trouble. Uh, he could have done a lot of things later on that he didn't do during that time. And I thought that was really decent of him. The second time is after the, uh, you know, the um, investigation went away and I'm on trial at Giuliani and I hear that Victor is on the, uh, the list. That's when I realized he was an undercover agent and all the tapes. Could, I said, man, they're going to bury me. And man, he got on the stand and he just told the truth, straight out truth. Yeah. And, you know, you know, Joe, up until that time in my life, I always thought the FBI just lie and they're bad and they frame and they do all this kind of stuff. That was my mentality. And he yeah. changed he changed my perception of people within the agency at that point. He really did. Yeah. Victor, Victor is a, is a unique undercover for the bureau. I mean, he, he obviously is out of the bureau now, mm -hmm. um, like like all of us. But he um, he, he played it straight. He played it really, he played it straight the way he should have played it. Um, he, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, something you don't know. Uh, at least I don't think you do. Mm -hmm. I used to go to the big fights every, you know, on the, for the multi, actually it was the closed circuit fights at Jack Newfield's house Jack, yeah. uh, on, on Saturday nights and your dad would come and he'd come often really? and he would bring the pastries from, from his from pastry shop. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he knew, knew the guy from well. Yeah, he would bring. He would walk in, and and it was an amazing crowd. By the way, you had Ray Kelly, the box, the, the uh -huh. commissioner of police, on sitting on one side of me, and Sonny Francis on the other. Okay, did you get along true with story. him? Story. Oh yeah, him? I spoke yeah. to him many times, yeah. many times, because Jack wrote an article about hit the fact that he thought his Jack thought he was framed yes. for that bank robbery conviction. Also, I had dinner at your house, okay, really? and your mother Tina cooked for me. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. But here's the thing that, that the point I was making was that I knew your brother, John, had a problem. And and uh, Victor and I talked more than once about that. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're staying away from that. That's not that's not what we're here for. You know, we're not what we're not going to do is exploit a situation where it's it's going to be even more harmful for the family. OK, they got let's stay focused. This is what we're doing. This is the this is the basic focus of our operation. You know, we're not, we don't need to be doing the other stuff. It's just that's him. And he couldn't agree more. And by the way, when he wore that nagger and played racquetball with you, I told him to let you win all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, Joe, I beat him. I beat him. <laughs> he was pretty good. Though. He, he that's not him. what he said, but you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna I'll I'll let you two guys decide that one. <laughs> Well, tell him, tell him I'll take a rematch right now if he wants, and we'll I see. Don't think, I, I don't, he's had a, a hip replacement, so I don't think he oh, wants really? to play. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. it. I'd yeah. have an unfair advantage then. No good. Even though I'm yeah, older he, than him, I think, but whatever. He he, uh, he, he was a, he was a pretty good athlete, I'll tell you, in yeah, his day. He was. And a great martial artist, by the way. I mean, a super martial artist. He yeah, really I liked was. him a lot. I liked yeah, him. Yeah, he's, he's likable. We, you know, he, he's, he's hard not we, to like uh, we flew down on my plane, I, I believe, to, uh, I think it was on my plane to uh, Miami to see. Miami. Yeah, what fight did we see that time together? Michael Dokes, Dokes or somebody, somebody down there. Yeah, right? somebody. Was it was, uh, I think it was a middleweight fight, if I'm not, I don't remember. But it was, uh, we, had a, we had such a good time together. I mean it. I mean it. You know, the one guy, though, that, I, that, uh, that did get caught up a little bit, I think, and you could have done him some damage with him, was Sharpton. I know he tried to, I think he tried to do a drug deal with, with Victor. We found out later on. I saw it on uh, some news report that they did on me about this whole thing also. But uh, yeah, that, that was not also not the focus of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, but I will tell you this.